So excited to have you all here. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's a great way to start my first WVEDS, so. <laughs> <laughs> What, what's your landscape? Is that a personal picture? Or? Uh, this is, it's actually the Indian Peaks in Colorado. You know, the, the Navy decided to pull us away from Colorado. So I like to remind myself of it all the time. Nice. <laughs> well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this Women's Veterans Empowerment Dialogue. I am very excited to be here. It is my second week with Warrior Scholar Project and I can't think of a better way than spending time with you all here today. I spent the past four years actually working as an education counselor or advisor on Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton and then Cherry Point. So I've spent many a times having conversations about what happens post-military. So I'm really excited to welcome our panel today. We're going to give them a chance to share a little bit about them. And then I have a series of questions to ask y'all. So Kat Corchado, I'm going to put you on the hot seat first. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Liz. It's an honor to be here. My name is Kat Corchado. I am an Air Force retiree, so I did 20 years in the service. And I am, I was going to say I was stationed. I'm not stationed. <laughs> I am living in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I've tried to keep a foothold in the veteran community. Um, I'm also a national consultant with the Women Veterans Network and trying to stay connected with women veterans. Um, I am also in the fitness industry. I've been in the fitness industry for 37 years in personal training and Pilates. And I just want to be always be talking about women veterans on any kind of panel or anything, because I think it's, it's still so really relevant. So thank you. We're happy to have you. Dr. Angela Carnes Padron, welcome. Hi. Yes, thank you so much. I am, uh, I'm pretty excited. This is one of my favorite topics. Uh, I uh, was active duty Air Force for seven years. Kind of keep that right over my shoulder. <laughs> uh, I've been out uh, and, and doing uh, work psychology, organizational development, uh, running my own company, Olympus Strategies uh, for several years. And then I went back in, I missed being a part of the military community um, and I know we're talking about identity, so there's a reason for that. I went back in uh, to Army Medicine uh, as a work psychologist. So I'm stationed as a civilian out in Germany right now, uh, getting a chance to be close to the fight. Wonderful. I don't know how I feel about all these Air Force people here as a Navy. <laughs> <laughs> Christine, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. I am an army vet, so spicing it up. Uh, I'm Christine Schwartz. I am the CEO of Service to School. I am an army vet, like I just mentioned. Um, happy to be here. Always want to support women, celebrate them, see how we can, um, you know, lift each other up and grow our networks and just, you know, be, be supporters of each other. Um, especially women as they transition out of the military or even while they're still on active duty. Um, just would always excited to hear your story and, and help you out in any way I can. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to wear my Navy spouse hat, but I'm also going to wear my former Marine Corps civilian. So then we've got everybody <laughs> here and hopefully we've got some Coasties in the audience and maybe some Space Force too. So Ladies, I've got some questions for you today, uh, but let's think about this as a dialogue, the opportunity to talk to one another as well. But uh, Kat, I wonder if you would tell us a little bit about how you, your experience in the military helped you with your transition. I wasn't sure that it actually did. Um, now that I look back, I think there were ways that it, it did, but you know, I, I transitioned over 22 years ago. So when I transitioned, there was nothing there you know, not that I was aware of, I won't say anything was there, but I wasn't aware of it. And I always tell people, I felt like that first round draft pick, you know, out of college, you know, balloons and music and a band and all this other stuff. And I walked out with my DD-214 and nothing was there. And I thought I had the wrong day, you know? <laughs> and so then I walked off, I, I did this free fall off of the cliff and I thought, what is going on? And I thought I was doing transition wrong. 
Okay. I thought it was me that I was the problem. And then as I've looked back at it, I realized that transition is about all those soft skills that you didn't realize you have that the military teaches you while you're in service, leadership, self-sufficiency, effective communication, integrity, teamwork, problem solving, adaptability. I had to use all of those, but I didn't know that I was using them, if that makes sense. You're so used to being a part of that team that you're using those skills all the time while you're in service. And then you leave service and you don't realize you're using them, but you're still using them. So all those soft skills that I learned in the military, I unintentionally use as I was transitioning. So that's kind of like a yes or an and no question. <laughs> I don't know. I, I just, I got to tell you, sitting across from so many of the service members that that kind of resonates with me. What about for you, Angela? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more uh, with Kat. I think for me, the biggest thing that helped with that transition was all of the growth and the confidence that came throughout the process. Um, you know, myself as a, a young mother, 19 years old coming in, I didn't know anything. I was just trying to put food in my baby's mouth, right? And so here I am seven years later trying to figure out oh, what is chapter two look like. Um, and so I think the only way that I got through that process was with confidence, with leadership, um, and just realizing that, wow, I'm a completely different human seven years later. I can do this, right? I, if I can do that, make that big leap then, then I sure as hell can make that big leap into whatever is next. So I'd say um, it, it has to come down to confidence in that leadership Christine, what about for you? Um, yeah, so my experience with transition, or, or I guess how the military assisted me, I, um, I, I found transitioning out of the army to be challenging. Um, I got out in early 2014, and I just had a hard time kind of communicating my skills and communicating what I had done in the army in a way that I felt was going to get me uh, a good job or even, you know, just like in a, a skill level appropriate job. Um, so I, I kind of struggled a little bit during that transition. But what I did know was that I, I loved being in the army and I loved it because the, you know, the camaraderie, working with people every day, serving other people. And I knew that that's what I wanted to continue to do. I knew I wanted to be in a job where I was working closely with people. And I felt that I was um, like a part of a team and I was making a big impact. So I learned that about myself in the army. And I think that as I did look for a job, those were things that were really important to me. Susan in the chat mentioned that sometimes she felt like you're not prepared mentally or psychologically for the grief process that comes. I'm wondering if y'all can relate to that. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I can. Oh, oh, go ahead. Um, I, uh, part of my my research dissertation, I pulled out Dr. Um, uh, Keebler Ross's stages of grieving. Um, as I was talking about that transition process, because that seems like that's a that is a very appropriate that we, uh, you know, some of the ladies that I interviewed for that research had a very short window to transition and it was like ripping a bandaid. Um, so we're immediately in shock and denial um, and they didn't have as long where some of the other ladies that I interviewed had up to three years. They knew this, this train was coming, right? And so they could actually go through those stages of grief and reach acceptance a whole lot faster, a whole lot smoother. Um, I completely resonate with that. <laughs> Kat, I saw you nodding your head along. No, I, I absolutely agree. I, I just think that you miss, what you don't think you're going to miss is that camaraderie with your fellow airmen or people that you're used to being around. And as you know, when you transition, if you move to some place where there aren't other veterans that you know of, you feel this sense of loss. It's like, where, where is everybody? And I, I told my husband this, I had gone to see my mom and she lives near Scott Air Force Base in Illinois. And I went on the base and I was like, these are my people, man. You know, I just felt so at home 
on a base. And I told my husband that he goes, you grew up on bases because I was a military brat. And he said, you did 20 years in the service. It's going to feel like home, but I still miss it. 22 years later, I still miss that, that feeling of belonging, that feeling of just having people in your corner. So I absolutely agree. And it's a shared language too. You know, I feel that way just as a military spouse, I go home and try to talk to some of my friends and I start throwing out all these acronyms and they just stare blankly (laughs) at me. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) What other challenges did y'all encounter during your transition? Um, yeah, I think the major one, and maybe this, this happened with Angela and Kat as well, was, um, learning how to communicate, um, everything that you have learned in the military. So your soft skills, um, your manage the, your manage all your management, um, qualities, your leadership qualities, putting it on paper, Um, And I think women, especially like we like to lift other people up and sometimes it's hard to talk about ourselves. And so, you know, you're in an interview and you're trying to explain what your job was as an army officer and you're, I wasn't doing a very good job of it. Um, And I think it was partially, I hadn't figured out how to communicate it. And I also didn't want it to seem like I had a big ego, like, oh, I did all these great things. I was an army officer. It's so great. Um, so that was, that was a struggle, but I think over time and as you get older and as I think you interview for different types of jobs, you learn how to communicate both your skills and your accolades and the things that you're good at um, and learn how to talk about yourself in a way that does represent you correctly. Other things that have been challenges or that y'all have encountered actually Looks like we've got a question from Rachel, who's in her first week of terminal leave before retirement. She said the feelings are really fresh. Um, What's helped you all process some of that grief associated with leaving the service? Mm -hmm. I'll I'll jump on that, Rachel. Um, Congratulations. Uh, And absolutely, I think you're talking to folks that have uh, can probably remember this stage very well because it's so uh, visceral and real right now for you. Um, I would I would say allow yourself the ability to focus on you and who you are. Um, this is all about veteran um, identity. So uh, many of the, the women that I've talked with over the years said that they they were so focused on getting that first paycheck or getting that first job that they didn't focus on who they actually were. And almost every single person that I talked with through the research process said, Who's, who, who am I anymore, um, right? I got issued uh, this, this job. Uh, it, most of us could safely say we didn't get our dream job in the military. We got assigned a job. <laughs> um, but we think that that's the job that we have to do in the civilian world. And so I would say, while you're in it, just embrace the fact that you have this fresh, clean slate. And, and roll with it and find those things that you're actually genuinely interested in and fulfill you, um, not the things you got assigned or that you think um, will bring in that next paycheck. Yeah, I'm just gonna piggyback on that is the one thing that I didn't do was stay connected to my veteran community and my veteran sisters, stay connected to them, get connected now because that network is gonna help you later down the road when you've gotten your job and everything settled down and then you're going to look around and go where is everybody where because we as women we don't readily just say hey i'm a veteran although we're trying to change that now but find find a veterans group find a veterans community where you feel like you where you feel like you belong stay connected with them It makes me think of a great place where we can find community and connection, which is at the Warrior Scholar Boot Camps. Hmm. Ah, wonder. (laughs) Just just one thought. But but, but in all seriousness, what are some other uh, groups, networks, things that you all have found that have helped you kind of create that community? I think the one thing that I found, and this was 17 years after the fact, so I... After 9-11, I found my veteran identity again. And I thought, well, I'm gonna go to these veteran organizations, but they were all so heavily populated by men. 
you know, there'd be a hundred people there and three women were at a table together, you know, huddled together at a table. And I think the one thing that I found was the Women Veterans Network was one. And I didn't know what it was. I just took this leap of faith because it was brand new at that point. And I've been with it ever since. Um, I've heard and, you know, like Veterati is one, another one. Uh, vets to industry. You know, I just keep diving into all these organizations. I'm like, ooh, what's this? And they keep um, they keep inviting me back. So I guess they're not tired <laughs> yet. But you know, just keep looking for those organizations. They're not all going to be for you. Find out. You know, pick two or three and just you know find out what they're about and see if it's something that's for you. So those are three that come to mind right now. Mm -hmm. I was going to say there, there are over 45,000 veteran service organizations, over 45,000. So that's remarkable and that's amazing. And at the same time, I hear all the time from folks, they're overwhelmed. They don't know where to start. They're like, uh, okay, I've got all these different options. Um, and, you know, as Kat mentioned, many of them are now focusing specifically on the, the needs of females. And that's, that's fantastic. Um, I think that's a, it, it's amazing. It's just, do you want to go for some of those bigger organizations like a, like a, a DAV or a Veterans Affairs, or do you want something closer to home? A lot of communities, local communities are trying to bring their veterans home. Uh, some of them doing it better than others. Um, so really trying to get involved in maybe your chamber of commerce and finding out what's local there uh, could be helpful as well. Um, yeah, I, I agree with both what Kat and Angela said, and there's there's obviously tons of nonprofits, service to school included, where you can mentor other um, veterans, you can, you, you know, the sky's the limit. There's so many great organizations where you can get together as, as a veteran and connect if it's mentorship, if it's community service. Um, so I, I always, you know, say, hey, if, if you want to stay, if you in that community if you want to get to know more veterans, especially if you live in a town that doesn't maybe have a lot of veterans, I think looking for nonprofit organizations where you can volunteer is a great way. Um, and you know, that's personally, I'm lucky I am a military spouse. So I'm, very, I'm still very tied in to the veterans community. I obviously run a veterans organization. Um, and then my sister's still on active duty. So that's really cool for, for me to have literally my sis, my sister in arms, my sister in biology, um, that I can talk to about military service and we can just share a lot about um, the army and what it was like as, as a woman. And it's, it's pretty great. Y'all are so amazing. I'm so excited to be a part of this group today. And I know I apologize because I've jumped all over and taken us totally off script. So I appreciate <laughs> y'all just going with me as we talk about this. Um, I just wanted to point out Chris in our chat actually said um, that they started their own group uh, to help kind of find that community and that support. So what a great way if you've got that time and that brain space. I'm curious during the transition for you all, how you found kind of your focus or direction? What helped you move through it? I mean, I can, I, I can start. Yeah, great. Um, I think for me, it was identifying that I wanted to still work in an in industry where I felt like I was serving people. Um, and I, I do happen to work with veterans, but I think I could work, you know, maybe in another industry, maybe it wasn't working with veterans, maybe it's working with children or the homeless population or something, but something where I felt like I was serving others, like that was very important to me. And so being able to identify that as I look for jobs um, was essential. I, I would say the first couple jobs, first or second that I got when I was, um, out of the army I didn't love and they weren't service oriented at all. They were for a tech company. Um, and so I went back and started working in the nonprofit sector and it, that's very important to me. And I think that if you um, kind of channel your energy into looking for jobs that like feed your soul, you're, you will end up in a good spot. 100% agree with Christine on that. I, uh, I'm, I'm, 
sometimes a shoot first, ask questions later type person. And so even while I was on terminal leave, I, uh, I, I, I chased after that paycheck. I went, oh, wow, there are all these sales jobs. They love veterans. Why? Because we move fast and we get shit done. Sorry, excuse me, but we do, right? And so the salesmen just come beating down our door um, almost immediately. And so I jumped on one of those and I went, okay, you know, I'll chase the money and I'll go after this first job. And, um, and while I was still on terminal leave, I became a licensed insurance salesman, which has nothing to do with where my heart is at. <laughs> it was just so random. <laughs> and so um, to stay focused uh, and, and, and redirect myself, I, I found myself just miserable and making tons of money and going, oh my gosh, this is completely not worth it. And I had to really regroup and actually throttle back and, and focus again. Like what, what really fills me? Um, and it, it was a process of journaling. I mean, uh, talking to people, mentors, I'd say, in, don't be scared of therapy, jump in, um, whatever, whatever that is to try to figure out and refocus um, who, who you actually are now. Yeah, I think I agree with, with both Christine and Angela. I think the one thing that you have to remember is where are your strengths? So when I, I was a communications project manager and I remember, going to a job interview and and I swear the young man behind the desk might have been 12 years old and he looked at my resume and he said well this is great but you don't have a degree and I said do you see those 20 years right there he, you know and he just looked at me like he didn't know what to say to that so while I was in the military because we all know we make so much money in the military um I had to get a part-time job so I was a single mom so I needed a part-time job without part-time hours. So I, I jumped into the fitness industry. You know, it was an hour here, hour there, I'd be back home. And so when that happened with that young gentleman, I, I looked at my husband, I said, I really think I could make it work in, 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 being, in doing fitness. And bless his heart, he's like, okay, you do what you want to do. And, you know, that... Again, those soft skills of not giving up and just moving forward, and I did, and I'm still doing it. So I think you have to know really what your strengths are and keep moving towards that. So that would be my advice. What helped, you all have kind of mentioned the finding the strengths and or finding that thing that feeds your soul. And Angela, you talked a little bit about therapy and journaling, but I'm curious kind of more broadly, what else helped you kind of find those aha moments or find that piece where you, you knew that was the right path for you? I don't yeah. think you know. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I'm serious. I mean, I don't know about the other two panelists, but I'm not sure that you actually know until you get into this kind of groove and you go, okay, I'm doing this. Like, I still feel I'm still transitioning. I know that sounds weird, but I feel as though I'm, I'm always transitioning. And so I think you get to a certain point where you're like, okay, this is working. Okay, I'm doing something I love, it's working, and keep moving forward. But you have to understand who you are as a person, that strength that you have. And as veterans, we, we rely on all of those soft skills, you know, that we're stubborn as hell. Okay. We're like, well, we're not giving up. I've done stuff much, much harder than this. So I'm going to keep it moving and see what happens. So I'd say one thing that, uh, that, that I did, and then that I heard from other ladies was they, they realized that some of the additional duties that they had in the military were things that they were interested in or passionate about. They weren't necessarily assigned those. And so um, many of the folks I've talked with over the years uh, said that because they had a passion for one of those additional duties that ended up becoming their whole career post-military. And so if you found yourself being an education liaison or, you know, spending a little extra time talking about this or doing this with other folks, you may have something there that might be your nugget, um, your thing to, 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 to follow and, and see if that that's really what you're passionate in, um, you know, really still leveraging uh, the things that you did while you were in. What did you actually love? Totally agree. I, 
always like to say it's you find yourself in a state of flow, right? Where you just, you're, you're so in the zone, you just keep going, you could do it all day. My, my Marines know this about me when they're coming in and I'm going back to back to back with appointments. I'm like, yes, this is it. I'm energized. This is where I want to be. <laughs> yep. Time gets lost. You're like, wow. Okay. That was so fulfilling. I don't even know where it all went. Totally agree. So what happens when y'all hit a roadblock? I think Kat said it, we just plow through it. <laughs> uh, yeah, you just, I think you have to kind of stand still for a second and just realize what's happening. You know, because there were times in the military, you know, even though I did 20 years and people think that that's awesome. There were times when I hated it. I didn't want to be there. I was like, if someone had offered me $50 to get out, I would have taken the $50 and left. But you have to just be still and and focus on you know maybe you just need to make a little pivot somewhere maybe you're pouring everything into what you're doing but you're not filling your own bucket you know of what you want to do those things don't require you to be out there but you're filling your own bucket with whatever that is and that's all about knowing who you are when you're not in uniform who is that person what do you like to do what are your hobbies you know do you like reading whatever that might be um, find out what that is and then, and then fill up your bucket so that you can help someone else with, in whatever job you're, that you have at the time. I completely agree. I think two steps forward and one step back is still forward motion, right? And so if you get that step back, that is okay. You are still trucking along. Uh, don't beat yourself up about it. Just keep walking. Um, so uh, just building that resilience and handling the, you know what, that's all right. <laughs> what am I supposed to learn from this? Uh, you know, and then, and then picking it up and, and moving forward again. I just want to add something too that if something isn't working, don't look at it as failure. Think of it as failing forward. Cause there are a lot of things that I did you know, I had this entrepreneurial spirit, but I mean, I sold everything, you name it, I sold it. But if I have to sell you, if I have to sell it to you, you either want it or you don't. So I, I, I sucked at all of it. Okay. I really did. I sucked at all of it, but I don't look at it as failure. I looked at it as failing forward because now I'm in a place that I really enjoy and I'm doing stuff that I really love doing. So don't think of it as failure. Think of it as failing forward. What about for those folks who maybe don't really see their military service as a part of their big identity moving forward and transition? Have you all felt that way or have you talked to other service members who have felt that way? I'd say 100%. I've talked with folks that, and one of the reasons why I, I took the research path that I did is because I was running into folks that didn't even identify as a veteran. Uh, and it surprised me because I'm, I'm loud and proud. <laughs> I'll tell anyone who wants to listen. Um, so that really blew my mind. And um, and the, the more I started to study that, I realized this is, there are large groups of people that don't identify as a veteran. And part of it has to do with um, stigmas and in and, and their workplace and that sort of a thing. Uh, and I would say that's okay for those folks, to, you know, that are, that are listening or that will hear this. Um, if, if, if you're not comfortable um, with that yet, it's it's a process um, that and, and and it could be part of those stages uh, of grief that we talked about where, you know, maybe there's denial for a while and, and maybe you do reach acceptance and maybe you don't and that's okay, just embrace it. Um, some of the ladies I, I interviewed with uh, said that they deliberately did not seek out veteran networks, even though they were proud to be a veteran, they identified as a veteran, they deliberately wanted to start to learn a new identity and so they focused on career field uh, and focused on civilian only um, organizations to try to learn what that's all about again. So whatever, whatever fits for you, um, I would say just roll with it and stay true to yourself. I think Christine, when you were talking about that, finding the place where you were able to give back and find that community that it might not be always with a veteran affiliated organization, but there's lots of nonprofit organizations 
and other spaces out there to find a community. And Sarah actually early on mentioned the volunteering and mentoring, but also thinking about serving on a board. So once again, a not a prepared question for you all, but are any of you all serving on any boards? Can you tell me a bit about what that experience is like, if you are? I'm not. I do not serve on a board, but service to school has a great board. <laughs> Uh, when I was uh, a straight civilian, I, uh, I've had to keep a foot into the military in some way, shape or form. So um, I got to this national laboratory and they had veterans and the veterans were being quiet. And within six weeks of getting there, I said, we need a veterans organization. We need a veterans group. So I rallied some of the people that were willing to identify as veterans. And I became the, the chairperson of that. And we started up. Uh, and tried to pull veterans out of the woodwork um, and really tried to, to rally them around Memorial Day, Veterans Day and different things, um, barbecues and such, uh, just to try to get them, you know, networking again. Um, so, I mean, that was highly rewarding. I think if you, the boards nowadays, one thing that COVID has, um, I guess a good, a good outcome is that so many of us can do things virtually. Um, so there's probably, you know, organizations where you could be on an advisory board or a board member and, you know, do things like this, call in and do a Zoom call. So um, tons of opportunities out there. And then something that I come across a lot is uh, large, and you mentioned this, large organizations have, they often have like affinity groups. So, and oftentimes they have a veterans affinity group where you can, you can join it. Um, I think there's often like volunteer opportunities within it, but um, those are becoming much more popular than I think they were a couple of years ago. And I think that's really cool that companies are that have affinity groups and then have specifically a veteran one. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's a great suggestion, Christine. Okay, y'all have thrown this word out a lot. Networking. <laughs> what about for the people that they hear the word networking and they go, Ugh, you know, yes, exactly. They want to hide. What tips or suggestions or maybe personal experiences have you all had with networking? I yeah, think that, I, I'll, I'll okay, go, ahead. go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, so I think networking is, that's how I have always found jobs is networking. Um, so not only is it just great for personal connection and meeting new people, but I think that um, as you transition and you are looking for employment, or maybe you're thinking about going to school, um, networking is essential. Putting yourself out there and, you know, saying, hey, I, I am looking for a job. I see you work at a, the company that I, I want to apply to or a company similar to a company I want to apply to um, and building those relationships and kind of even using your network to ask for help, you know, like, yes, you should give back when other people ask you, but don't, don't feel afraid to make it known that maybe you do need support um, during this transition process or support in finding a job and uh, reach out to people in that manner. I'd say for the folks that, um, from a networking perspective that are a little more introverted or shy, or I don't know how to go about this, um, maybe starting with a mentor, um, starting with one person, you one-on-one -on -one could help break that. Uh, Cause you know, certainly even virtually some of these groups get so big, like that's the industry, like, wow, there's 200 people on this call. I can't even take in all this information and, and it feels overwhelming, but um, some others uh, were with the mentoring piece and, and maybe maybe there's a cousin's brother's second son-in-law that you could you know link to that there's actually a connection there um, to help that that mentorship um, go even smoother. I think it's hard for me to think of veterans as not outgoing or <laughs> that's difficult for me, although I know it happens, but I think when you're networking, take it in small doses, you know, start off with a small group, get used to speaking with people. And when you are networking, make sure you, you know, exactly if you're going out to a group, um, who it is you're trying to meet, you know, what is your elevator pitch? You know, 
make sure you've got that down. What are you looking for? What do you need? And then turn around and ask that person, how can I help you? Because it's not a just it's not just about you. When they say this is what I'm doing, blah, 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 blah. And they you say, Oh, I'm looking for this, like, oh great. And you say, Hey, what do you do? Tell me a little bit more about you. It's reciprocal. People always, you know, it's not just take, 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 it's a give and take. And some people are really, I've met a lot of people at networking events that were horrible at it. They just, oh, here's my card. Thank you. And you're like, yeah, in the garbage. And, <laughs> but, you know, just have some questions, you know, know who you, who's going to be there if you can find out. And if you don't just talk to people, you know, walk up to people and, and say, hey, how are you? You know, what do you do? Put it on them. It's, and, you know, because if you're sitting at a table by yourself, no one's going to just walk up to you. It doesn't work. That's how my husband thinks networking is. That so you sit at a table, people come to you. And I said, no, honey, that's not how it works. <laughs> All right. My husband still won't even get a LinkedIn profile. So, you know, baby steps. I got to go slowly. So, I mean, I'm so Jeremy, I think, appreciates the, the networking. So I want to stand in a little bit and just say, I think authenticity really can help with networking, just being who you are. Um, if you're shy, it's okay, be shy, just be curious. If you're like me and you like to talk a lot, talk, but then make sure you give everybody else the space to talk. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, but I don't know about you all, but I found that most people that I interact with really love to do two things. They like to talk about themselves and they like to give unsolicited advice. And if you use those two things authentically, that's networking. Well, but I also think too, sometimes that people think that they know what, oh, you're a veteran and they feel like they know what you need. Mm -hmm. You know, if you know that there are going to be other veterans there, hang around that group, you know, talk to them. Cause I truly believe in networking that it's, it's the military community that's going to help the other military community. So it's, it's the veterans that are helping the active duty who are helping the ones transitioning. And we all act as this group. And I feel like the only people who understand us is other, other veterans, other people who've been there, done that. Mm -hmm. So if you go to a networking event that where there aren't any veterans, you don't know anyone, you're going to get that unsolicited advice of what they think, you know, um, what you should be doing. So stick around with your community. I think you'll find that that works a lot better. I'd say take take the advice in 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 doses as well, because um, you're exactly right, Kat. It, it, you're going to get unsolicited advice from all directions. Um, I I had a, a woman tell me that she went down a particular path um, post military because someone gave her that advice and she didn't listen to herself, right? And so she and she said, I was getting advice from all these different places. And that's part of having the 40, access to 45,000 veteran service organizations. Everybody wants to give you this advice. If you're, if you're willing to ask for it, you're going to get it. And sometimes when you're not asking for it, you're going to get it. Um, so <laughs> really trying to track, track that, keep notes. If you're going to go to a networking event, keep notes, what resonated with you, what didn't find those patterns um because it's going to come if you do go to these you will get you will get the advice that you're looking for um but uh, uh, brace for it uh and, and and stay connected with with inside mm -hmm. it, it's that question of i think discernment right that ability to hear something and then integrate it in what's relevant for you all speaking of solicited advice what advice would you all have for transitioning service members in this moment? I asked this question of everyone I, I interviewed for my dissertation. I said, what advice would you offer? Um, and uh, a couple of folks said, know that you have a voice um, and your voice in the civilian world is extremely important. So a team in the civilian world um, with a veteran on it is better is better off for your experience. So don't, just because the language is different and, and that, you know, Christine talked about that earlier, that, that we're trying to figure out your language versus the, 
the Greek I've been speaking in the military and how do we mesh those up? Don't lose your voice in that because um, it, it's easy to do. Stay, stay in it and, and educate them. And if your language is a little different, that's okay. Um, but you are very valuable. They need your voice um, and they need that leadership no matter what rank you were. You, you all know if you're in the military, you're a leader. Um, so that is uh, embraced by most organizations if you choose to speak up. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I, I didn't do at the time and I wish I had was consider higher education. Um, and you know, most of us have the GI Bill um, or they or we have some sort of benefit that will help us fund education. And depending on, you know, age, it can feel kind of awkward, like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm too old to go back to school. Um, but I think that going back and if you, if you're, if it's grad school, if you're like, hey, I want to get an MBA, I want to get a law degree you want to get a nursing degree, whatever it is, um, it's a great pathway. Uh, just going back, figuring out what you want to do, and then going in and seeking a degree that will um, contribute to that. Like, I want to be in the tech sector, but I know nothing about tech. Well, hey, go back to school for a few years, have some fun, use your GI Bill, and then the sky's the limit. So um, I definitely encourage people to think more heavily about that, and especially women veterans. Um, you know, service to school, we work with veterans every day that are going back to higher ed. And I just wish we had more um, women service members who were coming to us for support. It just seems that it's more almost male dominated that they're getting out and they're going back to higher education and the women aren't. And I think we should be. I think education is big. Also, um, there are a lot of benefits out there for veterans um, getting certifications. There are a lot of organizations that are saying, hey, you can take this certification free. So make sure you look into that. And I, I also understand that you have to know what you want. You know, when you get out of the military, at least when I did, I fantasize about what it was like to be a civilian. You know, I thought it was this like Emerald City type of thing, you know, and there's so many options out there for you take a little bit of time and sit back and, and really just write out a what if. What if I went to school? What if I started my own business? What if I did this? What if I, you know, and write out those what ifs and then start to prioritize them. Which ones really jump out at you and see if that's something that you want to do. I always talk to all veterans, male and female, that want that get out and try to do the same job they did when they were in the military. And the first thing I say is, is that what you love? I'm like, well, no, I get it. You need a paycheck. I get that. But maybe you get that job, but you also start, you know, that side hustle that you've always wanted to do. So there are so many options out there. Just, just know who you are when you're not wearing that uniform. And once you understand who you are as that person, then you can start to prioritize what those things are that you want to do that fit you as a person. Because believe me, there are a lot of people out there saying, oh, you don't need to do that. Why do you need to do that? Why don't you just get a real job? So you're going to hear that. But if, if in your gut and in your heart, that's what you want to do, then just do it. Go do it. I think it reminds me of a quote by Howard Thurman. I might not get it exactly right, but he said, don't ask what the world needs. Um, oh, I'm going to butcher it. I'm going to come back <laughs> with you all at the end. I had it in my brain and then I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> in the meantime, let me go. We've got a question in Q&A, but technology is not my friend here. So it's from Susan and I'm trying to pull it up, but maybe I'm doing it wrong. Maybe one of my fellow colleagues can help me navigate that. Ah, did you all struggle with imposter syndrome? Mm hmm. I saw that question and thank you for asking it. So my husband printed out and it's sitting right here on my desk um, from the the American Psychological Association feel like a fraud and, and the whole um, article talks about imposter syndrome and I'm struggling with it now people are calling me a doctor and guess what it feels weird. Uh, I'm not used to it. Don't know how, don't know how, how to respond to that. Um, and and I'm still looking around, like, who are you talking 
Uh, um, so I, I completely resonate with that. You know, I uh, did not come from other doctors um, and, and that's okay, but it's a, uh, it, it's a reality. Um, but I also think from a, from a um, veteran civilian perspective, we had to, in, when we were in, we had to, as females, we had to make a lot of adjustments in order to um, assimilate into the military, right? Um, almost every single person I, I've talked to along the way talked about, I had to not talk about my children, not talk about my family. I had to, um, I had to check all of my feminine qualities and leave those at home. I had to not be emotional and do all these different things that took away from our true identity. Um, that, you know, when we're getting out, we're like, wow, I, I don't, I, you know, we keep, we've talked about it this whole time. Who am I now? But also if I try something out, I don't feel, it doesn't, it's not going to feel natural. You're going to feel like an imposter. It's going to feel weird um, because you're trying something on. Is this really me? Is this not? And that second guessing could really feel like, hmm, I, I'm kind of faking it. And I'd say that that is okay. That adjustment, just knowing and just giving yourself the space and grace that there's going to be an adjustment there where you feel like an imposter, no matter how long you've been preparing for this transition, um, and 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 just roll with it and give yourself that 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 space to do that. And and I wouldn't judge yourself on how long it's taking either. I'd say just let it be natural and just find the true you, and 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 that's okay. So absolutely, it's real. It's a real thing. I just want to say that just just keep doing it. You know, the one thing that I realize is, you know, you go through this imposter syndrome through any transition in your life. Like Andrew said, going from not being a doctor to being a doctor. You know, when I first became a Pilates instructor after a year of being, you know, as an apprentice, and all of a sudden I was an, a Pilates instructor, and I was like, no, I'm not. You know, and so anytime there's a transition, even when I, you know, I started my own podcast and I thought, Oh, I'm going through that imposter syndrome. And I was like, no, wait, wait, wait. I went back through that before. Just take a breath. Just take a breath. Because the more, longer you're doing it, the more, it's like wearing a uniform. Remember the first time you put on a uniform and you're like, holy crap, what is this? And it felt weird, right? You didn't know where the name tag went. You didn't know all this stuff. And all of a sudden, boom, you're doing it. And it starts to feel normal. So just take your time get used to the idea whatever that idea is give yourself some grace and just eventually you're going to go wow i'm a veteran okay you know or i'm whatever that blank is fill it in just just give yourself some time and some grace it'll start to feel like it's part of your skin after a while you too dr angela <laughs> i'd love to talk to dr angela I think that's very helpful because, you know, I did my dissertation 13 years ago and I still don't like it when people call me Dr. Morningstar. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing to share or not, but it's, it's real. Um, speaking of doctors, Dr. Howard Thurman, I found his quote to share with you all. So it's, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Mm. Yeah, what lights you up? Yes, I love that quote. And isn't that, wouldn't that be a better question to ask even little kids as they're growing up? What makes you excited? What makes you come alive instead of what do you want to be when you grow up? Because I think one of you all already alluded to this. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I really like what I'm doing in this moment. So that must mean something. Ah, we've got a good question. Do you all have any good book recommendations on this topic of identity? Oh, God. I just published my dissertation so today. Books. So there's a book. <laughs> hey, hey, say that again. Of, <laughs> of veteran identity. <laughs> Can't say that it's good, but. <laughs> No, I, I honestly, I, I, I would say, though, if you're if you are really interested in this topic, there are some um, articles, research articles out there, most mostly uh, 
male focus on the veteran transition, which is one reason why I did the dissertation I did, but the, the research is mainly on the, the male, uh, you know, military to civilian transition, um, but there are a few folks that have studied female um, transition as well. Um, so you could Google Scholar, uh, probably find some articles um, related to that specifically. I can't, yeah, I'm trying to think, I can't remember the name of the book that I read, but it, it might be like Design Your Life. I'm not, I'm not sure. Is that it? It was, it was like a Stanford um, yes. professor designing the mind. No, it's Designing it's Your Life by, by Bill Burnett and Dave Evans. I'll try yes. to type it in the quote. Oh, okay. And it has exercises in it where uh, you essentially are like, what, what does your ideal day look like? Do you want to drop your kids off at school? Do you want to have time to make yourself breakfast? No. Do you want to start working as early as possible? Maybe you want to make a ton of money. Like it's really up to you, but it helps you walk through um, building, finding a career that you want to build your life around or you know what I'm saying? Like not finding a career for a paycheck, but like designing it intentionally. So it fits into the life that you want. Mm -hmm. that's how I got here at WSP y'all just saying that book <laughs> design the oh, life you love. oh love it design the life you love and it's mainly illustrations so it's what you were just talking about Christine and you actually draw it prompts you uh to kind of draw through so that you're in this discovery mode of finding yourself design the life you love I would also put in a plug for, it's called Untamed by Glennon Doyle. She has a workbook as well, and she does a lot of really cool exercises and has some great writing. And then I'm sure some of you all are familiar, but I'm a big fan of Brene Brown and her work. Oh, yeah. Even before you were in my were. mind. I was literally thinking of both, <laughs> both of those women as well. <laughs> Well, I want to make sure if in case any of our participants have any questions for this wonderful and fabulous panel, it's not just me asking the questions. So feel free to type your questions in the chat or in Q&A so we can take advantage of this amazing set of brains we have on display and hearts, <laughs> not just brains. <laughs> What do y'all like to do for fun outside of your careers? What brings you joy? These days it's schnitzel and beer and pretzels um, <laughs> in Germany. But no, I actually have a two-year-old son and I have a 23-year-old son. So um, uh, I, uh, I do a lot with the two-year-old. I'm able to focus with my, with my oldest. I was deployed all the time and it was a very different um, experience raising him so now i'm able to kind of slow it down and focus on the little one um which has been a blast yeah i i have um i have three three little kids and so i don't really have hobbies <laughs> laundry um, <laughs> but no honestly any any of my time i i just spend love love hanging out with them and laughing and um just soaking up all the time when they're little i think for me um i'm gonna go with uh dr angela but mine's gonna be ice cream love ice cream um my podcast i get so much joy from from doing that it gives me such it gives me this thrill every time i do it i love doing that i love being with my dog uh brady he's a cavalier king charles spaniel um, anytime I can, I can give back, you know, anytime a woman veteran calls me and says, Hey, do you know, blah, blah, blah. And I go, yeah, I do. And they're like, Oh my God, thank you. And I'll just, and I hang up the phone going, wow, I love this. <laughs> um, anytime I can give back, you know, I just, I just did a certification. Um, it's called the cancer exercise training Institute where I can help, uh, cancer survivors you know, get some strength and get some control over their body through Pilates. So that gives me a lot of, of just, just helping people. I think that's, you know, we're, 
we're, you know, we're in service in the military, but I think we always want to be out of, out of service. We want to be of service when we're out of the military. So. Uh, Roxy did have a question. Roxy was curious. Is there anything you would do differently? I think that's a great question. And I, I, I would probably try to slow it down as much as I could and, and soak it up because those were really fantastic years. Um, you know, we, we had a saying, embrace the suck. Um, but, you know, even, even deployments to the sandbox and not knowing where you're going tomorrow and all of those things that felt so chaotic and dramatic um, were really uh, amazing experiences. Um, so I would probably say I would, I would just bask in it uh, a little bit more and, and uh, relish it. Um, but then when it comes to the transition, uh, what I would do differently is I try to throttle back, uh, maybe not jump into an insurance agent job, um, but actually do the focusing on what, what I actually uh, enjoy first and um, some of that advice that we've already given. Yeah, I, I hate to say I would do anything different because then I don't know if I would be where I am today. But um, I think I was so stressed out about finding a good job. I, I like I literally gave myself an eye twitch, um, just like stress, just I don't know, like this fear of the unknown. The, the military is so um, you're always going to have a paycheck. You know when you're going to get promoted. It's very linear. Um, and so not knowing where I was going to get a job, what the job was, um, was I going to have a salary? It was just so like profoundly stressful to me. And I wish, like you're saying, I would have just like taken a deep breath, <laughs> done some yoga. I should have called cat and <laughs> <laughs> it's going to work out. Things will work out. Lean on, like we said, lean on your network, have some self-confidence that it will work out. Um, and hopefully don't stress out as much as I did. I don't think I stressed out so much. I think I, it was just that uncertainty that bothered me. You know, like Christine said, you know, everything is linear in the military. You know, everything's taken care of. You don't have to worry about paying for medical dental. It's taking care of you. People, you know, you're told when your appointments are here, you guys show up at this place at this time, then you get out and, it, and it's, it's all on top of your own head. Would I have done anything differently? If anything, I think I would have taken the time about two years prior to getting out to find out who I was. I think I had an idea, but just to be able to say, okay, I know exactly what I wanna do and then go right into that direction. Um, I think I would have taken that time, but anything else, I, I think I'm exactly where I should be right now. I'm exactly where I should be. So. Yes and no. <laughs> I have, I, I, I don't want to keep you all too, too late, but I, I want to get in this question from Jeremy because it, I think it's important, which is the best advice on dealing with autonomy changes. So. Like feeling <laughs> like you have autonomy? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm guessing, right? Going from a system that's closed and the expectations are clear. And as y'all mentioned, right? You know what's coming next. It's a somewhat predictable thing to all of a sudden being, having all of this autonomy thrust onto you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I, yeah maybe, maybe it's the helpful thing is being intentional as you think of how you want to design that life. Um, and perhaps that would, that would help. The funny thing is, I think like after you get out of the military, maybe in like a couple of years, two years, three years from now, I think like your the autonomy is fabulous. Um, you realize, wow, this is great. I don't necessarily have to answer to you. Well, I don't have to exercise at 5.30 AM. Um, <laughs> so yeah, being, being prepared for it and, and being intentional about what you want your life to look like, um, but then maybe too enjoying the autonomy. It, it can be, it can be great. Yeah, I, think I think it can be great initially because you can't, you looked forward to it. And all of a sudden you, you feel this sense of isolation and loneliness i think for a lot of women that i've talked to feel that way and that's when that mentor and those those groups come together because they're the ones that can help you feel connected and you don't feel alone but you've got this this network that's helping you 
you know, because you start talking to them and they might bring up stuff that you never even thought of. So, you know, being autonomous is, is okay. But when you've been there too long, you feel like you're isolated and isolation, no one likes that. And so, you know, get out there and find those groups and, and be connected. You know, everyone needs that time. You know, you're like, oh, I don't want that anymore. And then you get to a point where you're like, wait, wait, maybe I do want that <laughs> just on my terms now. So, you know, em embrace that autonomy and then, you know, slowly get back into it with your, with your veteran network and, you know, with, or, and, or with a mentor. Great. So I want to give a quick plug, but I'm going to leave you all with one more thing to go that will wrap up. So I'm going to give the three of you one quick thing to think about, and then we'll do a couple of announcements and wrap up. So Susan's question said, what's the most important thing you've learned about yourself through the transition process? So I'm going to stretch the three of you all, and I want you to see if you can come up with that in one word. And while you think about what's that one word that encap encapsulates that value or strength that you've taken away, uh, I want to mention the Warrior Scholar Boot Camps, which are open now. Y'all can go to warrior-scholar.org slash apply to visit. And I also, I'm poor Christine, I'm giving her double duty, but I'd love for you to mention any of the upcoming service to school events that folks should be paying attention to. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, we are having a virtual admissions fair on April 14th, and it is for um, veterans who are thinking about either an MBA or law school. We have some of the best schools in the country, um, Yale Law School, Haas School of Business, you name it. So you can join virtually, meet with admissions counselors, admissions representatives from those schools, and um, hopefully start thinking about maybe if grad school is the right path for you. I love it. Wonderful. I want to thank each and every one of you for your time, your insight. You are three very incredible women. And I want to wrap up today with your, your one word summary. Um, Whoever powerful. wants to go first, because I know that was a big ask. Yeah, I would just say powerful. Um, that's that's my one word. I felt powerful, like I need to own my transition. Um, and I had full power in how that went. Perseverance. I love it. Just keep moving forward. Um, Self-love. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you all. Thank you to, for everybody that joined us today. Y'all made a great first WVEDS event for me. So thank you. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.